Hi, this is David from Mash IT, and today we're going to be reviewing the new Microsoft Surface Pro 7 Plus. Now this is a bit of an odd release, because we were all expecting it to be the new Microsoft Surface Pro 8, but Microsoft in their infinite wisdom have decided to make this the 7 Plus and only release it to the business and education markets. Now what that means is basically you're not going to be able to go to your normal retail outlets and pick one of these new 7 Plus models up. But they are still readily available if you do search around on the internet, and I think it's definitely something to look for if you are interested in a Surface Pro and you want something a little bit better than the Surface Pro 7. So just a little bit of background information before we get into this review itself. We bought this model for Gary to use in the office. Now Gary is our editor and does all of our Photoshop and video editing. He's had a Surface Pro 4 since back in 2015 for his mobile device. He's absolutely loved it. He does a lot of drawing on it, he does a lot of Photoshop, editing, on the go on his little Surface Pro 4, but it's really getting quite slow. We were going to get the Surface Pro 7, but it just didn't seem a big enough update to be worth us buying one to replace the Surface Pro 4. But with this new Tiger Lake version, we've finally decided it's time to bite the bullet and give this one a try. So here's the new Surface Pro 7 Plus. And if you've seen any Surface Pro since the Surface Pro 3, it really won't look any different. Here is Gary's Surface Pro 4. So as you can see, the form factor has remained the same. Now obviously a lot of people have complained about this, you know, obviously this is like four or five years worth of releases, and the only thing that they have changed is the USB-C port on the Surface Pro 7 and 7 Plus, whereas the old Surface Pro 3s, 4s and 5s, and I think 6, had a mini display port. Other than that, they're pretty much identical. The panel is the same on both of them, although we've got a slightly enhanced colour tone on the new panel. And obviously the process has changed. And other than that, the chassis themselves remain pretty much identical. They use the same Surface Connect magnetic adapter. They've got the same USB port, they've got a micro SD card slot. They've got the same forward facing speakers, the same button layout. It's got a slightly rounded look to the new one, which is, is hardly noticeable. You will feel a difference, but that's about it. But other than that, if you picked up either one of these and walked into an office, nobody would tell which Surface Pro that you've got. And I know that's been a lot of complaints from people in reviews over the years, the fact that Microsoft haven't changed it. And it is a bit of a shame. You, I would like to see a slightly bigger screen or a nicer screen in this Surface Pro. But there are some plus sides to this. Now, Gary bought this Surface Pro 4 back in the end of 2015 and he's been using it sort of day in, day out for just his mobile work ever since, and it's served him really well, but it is getting slow. Now by buying the Surface Pro 7 Plus, what we're gonna be able to do is take his pen, it works on the new model, so he doesn't have to buy a new pen. We can take his Surface type cover, and it works on the new model. We've got a dock, we've got a few of the power packs around, and they all work between any of the Surface models. So although it is a bit of a shame that they haven't updated this model over the few years, in an office environment there are a lot of benefits. Gary's bought this new model, he can literally set the model up with his applications and documents on it, and then plug it straight into his desk or wherever he's using it with his dock and other bits and pieces. And he's not having to change all the power supplies, keyboards, pens, every time he buys a new model. There are some benefits that Microsoft have kept this design the same. Now looking around the Surface Pro, just in case you haven't seen a review already on the last few years of Surface Pros, obviously you have the kickstand. This makes it great for drawing. The range of angles goes right down to here to make a comfortable drawing canvas for you. Now the kickstands as well can come right up here to be a comfortable viewing angle when you're not drawing and then you can just literally push it back and draw on whatever angle you like. And as long as you don't put too much pressure on the screen, you can have it set to any of these angles and it will stay there. It will actually allow you to draw at those angles to give it a comfortable drawing, writing, experience. Now on the right side of the surface, we've got the Surface Connect adapter. Not only does it allow the magnetic adapter to charge your uh, Surface Pro, but also you can have the Surface Dock, which will plug in here and give you another range of ports. Now this could be a kind of a moot point because you've also got at the very top a USB-C and you can use just a USB-C hub. Now the Surface Pro can also be charged 
via the USB-C, or you can plug it into a USB-C monitor and use it as a dock that way. So it's quite versatile, you've got a number of options for docking it. And as well as the USB-C, we've also got an old-fashioned USB-3. Now personally, for myself, this is a massive positive, and I'm so glad that they haven't taken this away and given us two USB-Cs, because I still regularly want to plug in a mouse, USB stick, and I don't want to be like faffing around for dongles like I do on my Mac. So I love the fact that they've kept an old-fashioned USB-3. On the left-hand side, we've got a headset jack, and that is about it. On the top of the surface, we've got the power button, and we've got the volume rocker. And then on the back, underneath the kickstand, we finally got, this is something that I've been waiting for for a long time, and one of the reasons we didn't want to buy the Cephalo 7, seven, we can now finally upgrade the SSD. This is a really big deal because there's nothing worse than buying a device, the SSD fails a year or two down the line and you can't do anything with it. Now, you can pop this cover off and it's only a 30 mm M.2, but you can change that. We will do a video in future in how to change this SSD and install the operating system. And just underneath the actual kickstand is the micro SD card. You can pop a card in there and use it as, as extra storage if you wish, or just, you know, reading micro SD cards. Now, when you buy the Surface Pro 7 Plus, you will literally only get the tablet itself and the power pack. You don't get a pen in the box anymore, you used to years ago, and you don't get the Surface Type cover. Now, fortunately, because these have been out for a few years, you can easily pick these like, peripherals up cheap off eBay or Amazon and add them to your Surface. I wouldn't go out and buy a brand new one from the Microsoft store and pay over hundred pounds for one when you can probably pick one up for 40, 50 pounds on eBay. Or you could just use a Bluetooth keyboard if you want to save yourself some money that way as well. If you're, especially if you're just using it mostly for drawing or docking into a monitor. Now just very quickly, in case you haven't used a Surface before, the type cover itself is a fantastic input device. You've got a reasonably small touchpad that works very well and it's very smooth and you've got a fantastic feeling keyboard. The keys are crisp, well-spaced, they're backlit, and they have great feedback, so they're lovely to type on. It's a great typing experience on these Surface Pros. The only downside of these, because it is a type cover that is flimsy like this, putting it on your lap is not the most comfortable experience. You can do it, but you've got to be careful you don't knock it off your knees. Now, obviously, it's up at a slight incline as well to make it more comfortable. That's how bond by magnets. But you can also pull the magnets away and lay it flat as well if you wish. And then when you're finished with it, popping it up and that will actually set it to sleep. So it's quite nice, you pop it away and you're done. Now moving back onto the actual device itself, obviously this is a touch screen. It's very responsive. The pen is very responsive as well. Uh, it's great for drawing. Although the, the pen experience is great, especially for notes, if you are drawing slow lines, there is a bit of jitter still, and this is something that Microsoft hasn't sorted for years, but I believe it's in the technology rather than Microsoft's problem themselves. But it is a bit annoying, so if you are drawing slow lines, even with a ruler, there'll be a little bit of jitter on there. But it is still really lovely having that functionality, and you do get used to the sort of the jitter, and you work around it with obviously not using particularly slow lines. The screen itself is a three by two aspect ratio, and the resolution is 2736 by 1824. So it's a nice and high DPI, so everything is very crisp on the screen. By default, it's set to 200% scaling settings within Windows. I'll normally knock it down a little bit if I'm working on spreadsheets or Word to get a bit more information on the screen, but it does look great at 200%. We have stereo front-facing speakers at the top here. They sound pretty good, but they don't get overly loud. We just put some royalty-free music on so that you can hear them. Okay, so I'm going to do a very quick audio test. The speakers are at 50% volume, and I'm going to put just some royalty-free music on from YouTube. And here we go. So I'm going to increase the volume. It's about 65%. So as you can hear, it's very crisp, it's very clean, it sounds good, but there's not a lot of bass and it doesn't get overly loud. But if you're just sitting right in front of the surface, it's quite nice, you know, certainly good for YouTube podcasts, a little bit of music, you know, if you can't be bothered to put a headset on. So it's certainly okay in a pinch, but you know, you're not going to be filling a room with like decent audio like a MacBook Pro 16. But they're, you know, they're, they're good sounding speakers, they're certainly not tinny like some of the cheaper laptops out there. So then lastly, we're going to move up to the top of the surface and we're going to talk about Windows Hello feature and the webcam.
So this obviously has Windows Hello built in and it's obviously done by Microsoft and probably the best implementation of Windows Hello I've come across. It's so fast, when you open the machine or turn the machine on, it logs you in so quick, you don't even realize that it's done it sometimes. You're literally straight at your desktop. I was never bothered by Windows Hello or password authentication or fingerprints until I started using on the Microsoft surfaces. It's so convenient that now if I go to a machine that needs a fingerprint or a password to be typed in, it actually feels like a chore. It will even pick you up if you're at a bad angle or in low light, so it's really well done. So let's test the webcam and microphones. So this is the test of the webcam and the microphone on the Surface Pro 7 Plus. So you can see it's a very good webcam and microphone setup on this Surface Pro 7 Plus, and probably one of the reasons that these are great in a business environment. Uh, also, rear camera takes great pictures as well, which is unusual for a laptop straight two in one machine. Now with regards to Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, this has got Wi-Fi 6 built in and it has got Bluetooth 5. I'm running my Performance MX Master 3 via Bluetooth and that is really snappy and no dropouts or problems with that. And the Wi-Fi has been great, the range has been great and it's, it's been strong with no dropouts. So we've looked at the actual Surface Pro 7 Plus itself. What we're going to talk about now is one of the main reasons that you'll be looking at buying this over the Surface Pro 7 or, or previous generations is the fact that it's got a Tiger Lake processor in there. We've already talked about the fact that you could upgrade the SSD with this generation, but the other biggest change with the 7 Plus is the fact that it's using a Tiger Lake processor and Intel XE graphics. Now we've got the i7 version here. There is also an i5 and an i3 version. Now the i5 and the i3 versions are completely fanless. So if you're looking for a device that has no fan noise, then you might want to look at the i5 or the i3, depending on cost. Now the i7 does have a fan, and we're going to look at how noisy that gets and whether it is distracting. And we've also got an i5 on the way. So we're going to do an i5 versus an i7 comparison review to see how much extra performance the fan gets you on this i7. So please like and subscribe and hit the notifications bell if you want to see that video which will be coming up shortly. Okay, so as I said, this is the i7 model with 16 gigabytes of RAM. We're now gonna fire up a few benchmarks and a very brief look at the performance of this i7. Okay, so I'm gonna start running the benchmarks. So the laptop is plugged in, we're switched to best performance. So the first benchmark was Cinebench R20. In the multi-core CPU benchmark, we scored 2001 points, which is a really good show for this i7 Tiger Lake CPU. Now this score was on par with our other Tiger Lake laptops we reviewed, the X1 Nano and the XPS 9310, which both had the i7 Tiger Lake CPUs. Following this, we ran the Geekbench 5 CPU test. Now on this uh, benchmark, we scored 1,542 on the single core and 5,622 on the multi-core scores. Again, almost identical to other Tiger Lake i7 CPUs. So we're not throttling down because, of the, because we have got a fan on the i7 in this Surface Pro 7 Plus, and it does allow us to boost nicely with this uh, CPU. Moving over to the GPU side with the XE graphics, we completed the Geekbench 5 OpenCL to test the graphics and we scored 18,717. And again, this is on par with the X1 Nano's sort of benchmark that we scored about the same and slightly ahead of the XPS 9310. And a lot of this comes down to how the actual manufacturer tunes that XE to utilize the actual CPU wattage of the overall CPU package. And for the last benchmark, we completed a 3D Mark Time Spy. We scored 1,775 overall, with a graphics score of 1,593 and a CPU score of 5,071. Again, this is very, very similar to the other Tiger Lake benchmarks we've completed with the i7 Tiger Lake, and it is a good showing for the actual score for, the, for these sort of tests. This isn't a gaming machine in any way, but you will be able to play some sort of light titles like Dota or uh, League of Legends on this machine. We will do a more in-depth review on the sort of performance on this machine in a separate video if you are interested in that. So I just want to talk about sort of thermals and the noise on this Surface Pro 7 Plus. It takes a while for the fans to spin up, which is quite nice. So in day-to-day -day use, you're not going to hear the fan on the actual i7. But if you're running a longer-term benchmark, such as Cinebench R20, or if you're rendering video, the fans will spin up. Now what I've found is the TDP on this chip, it will boost right up to about 45 watts for a few seconds, and then it will drop to 30 watts for quite a while before throttling back due to temperatures to 22 watts. And it will stay there with the fan running at 22 watts. 
So after completed a few runs of Cinebench just to get this machine quite sort of heat soaked and warm it up nicely, the fan is spinning up. It didn't spin up for the entire first run with the Cinebench R20 uh, and it started to spin up on the second run. You can see the speeds, it's still at about 3.5 gigahertz at the moment, so that's pretty good. And you can hear probably through the microphone the fan. I'm gonna pop the decibel meter so we can see what sort of decibels it's pumping out at. So we can see it's topping out at about 43 decibels. So we're not talking gaming laptop sort of levels of noise, but you certainly can hear it when you are rendering or benchmarking it for a little while. But in day-to-day -day use, I didn't hear the fan at all. So all in all, I'm more than happy to have a little bit of this fan noise if I was rendering something out to keep that performance up uh, than having it silent and having it throttled down. But this is something we're gonna test in a further video when we've got the i5 in stock. Well, now with regards to battery life with this model, apparently at Microsoft have increased the battery size capacity by about four or five uh, watt hours. I didn't notice a massive amount of difference in improved battery life. On our Wi-Fi YouTube music streaming test that we normally run, at 50% brightness and about 40% volume on the speakers, it lasted seven hours and 41 minutes, which isn't a bad amount of time for, for that sort of test with this device. A lot of the Ultrabooks are hitting about 10 hours on this sort of same test, and the new MacBook Airs and Pros are hitting anywhere between sort of 15 and 16 hours on this test. You can see Microsoft, you know, it's quite a shortcoming on this machine. So that leads me into the conclusion. And I do find it difficult to make a conclusion on this Surface Pro Plus model, because it is quite an incremental update. Now, I would say to you, if you have got a Surface Pro 6 or a Surface Pro 7, I wouldn't rush out to sell your old Surface Pro to buy this 7 Plus. But if you're coming in fresh or you've got a Surface Pro 4 like Gary's got, it's a nice improvement and it is well worth it if you're looking for this Surface Pro form factor. It's a great machine for drawing, using as a tablet, although the tablet experience is nowhere like an iPad Pro or iPad experience because Microsoft haven't got anywhere near there yet, but it is usable in that scenario. It's got a great, set of input devices with this uh, type cover keyboard. The speakers are good. The Windows Hello is brilliant. It's got a lovely crisp screen that gets you know, reasonably bright. The kickstand on this is amazing. I mean, I regularly just rip my keyboard off, pop it up on the kickstand, and then I'll dock it to my computer and have the keyboard right in front of it. And it gives you that second screen right below your monitor. So features like this in an office environment, I find really useful. The fact that you can use this with all your old accessories, in my opinion, because we have a lot of Surface accessories over the offices, is really useful for us. Gary can come from his office to my office, plug straight in and he's up and running, no problems whatsoever, because we've got docks and power supplies all over the place, having used these for years. So looking at the Surface Pro Plus over the Surface Pro 7, which Microsoft are still selling, obviously this is a more expensive device. The main differences between the Surface Pro 7 Plus and the Surface Pro 7, and the biggest feature in my opinion is the fact that you can now upgrade the actual SSD yourself. Microsoft charge you an absolute fortune to increase the actual SSD on the devices, well more than is justified. To be able to do that yourself now, or to at least as well be able to change it if your SSD dies in a year or two down the line, is a massive plus for the Surface Pro 7 Plus, no pun intended. You've obviously also got the new improved Tiger Lake CPU, which although the CPU isn't a massive amount better, the single core is a lot better, but the multi-core isn't a lot better. The graphics are a big update over the 10th gen Intel graphics. So that will be a good reason to pay the extra premium over the Surface Pro 7. Also as well, because this is the education and commercial model, you actually get Windows 10 Pro with this model over just the Windows 10 Home on the standard Surface Pro 7. So again, that's a bit more value added feature in there over the Surface Pro 7. And lastly, as an option, and it's quite an expensive option with the Surface Pro 7 Plus, you can have LTE, but you do lose the micro SD card reader. But if that's something that you want, you can have that with the Surface Pro 7 Plus, which you cannot have with any of the other Surfaces other than the Surface Go. Now, as I said, we've got the i5 model coming in soon, so we're gonna put the two together and see how the i5 compares to the i7. And we will be going into further detail on the i7's performance for video editing, Unity, Blender, some other applications that we use on a day-to-day -day basis to see how this copes with those apps. So if you are interested in seeing those videos or the other reviews of the laptops that we've got coming in in the next couple of weeks, please like and subscribe and hit the notification bell and you will be notified of the upcoming videos. Thank you for watching.